My wife Gretchen and I had been having problems for a long time. We'd been together since high school and I think we were just growing apart. For the last few years, I could tell that Gretchen was pulling away. She'd find excuses to leave the house and then lie to me about where she was. After a while, I figured out that she was having an affair. I knew I should have confronted her about it, but I didn't have the courage. Instead, I did something truly awful. I got on a dating app and decided to find someone myself. It didn't take long before I matched with a beautiful blonde woman named Nikki. We chatted for a bit and I was very open about everything. She knew that I was married and didn't want anything besides a hookup. She was fine with that. We arranged to meet for the first time at a hotel just outside the city. It wasn't in a nice area, but I figured that I wouldn't run into anyone who knew me. I told Gretchen that I had a work conference to go to. I got to the hotel just around sunset. I checked into the room and texted Nikki. She didn't respond. I waited in the room, took a shower, waited some more, and Nikki never came. Eventually, I got a single message from her. Changed my mind. Sorry. She wasn't coming. I was going to be here alone. I guess it was my own fault. I should never have done this in the first place. I was a married man, and maybe this was fate telling me not to betray my wife. I thought about going home and telling Gretchen that the conference had been canceled, but I knew that was a bad idea. She'd have too many questions. So instead, I just curled up in bed and started watching the hotel TV. I was feeling pretty sorry for myself, and after a while, I needed to get out of that room. It was just so depressing. So I put on my shorts and went down to the hotel's pool. When I got there, I noticed a woman sitting in the jacuzzi by herself. She was blonde, and for a second, I thought that it was Nikki. But when she turned to look at me, I realized that it was just some stranger. She smiled at me and I smiled back. I joined her in the jacuzzi and right away, we hit it off. Like me, she was staying there alone. She didn't tell me why she was there, which was fine by me, because I didn't want to explain myself either. We chatted for a bit and then she asked me if I wanted some company in my room. At first, I thought that my wishes had come true. Nikki never showed up, but I would found someone else instead. It was perfect. Then I started having some doubts. Maybe she was a hooker. I know it sounds hypocritical since I'd come here to cheat on my wife, but I wasn't interested in paying for sex. That was too much. Still, she was very beautiful. I didn't want to ask her point blank, so I casually asked what she did for a living. I'm a waitress, she explained. That was good enough for me. I invited her up to my room right away. We got out of the jacuzzi and walked up to the second floor. Her room was a few doors down from mine, and she had to run inside and change. I told her my room number and said I'd wait for her there. Very excitedly, I ran into my room, changed out of my wet shorts, and waited for her to knock. I waited 10 minutes and she never showed up, then 20. I started to think that maybe she'd change her mind. I should have just gone to bed, but I couldn't stop thinking about this woman. I didn't even know her name, but she was so beautiful and so close. I grabbed my room key and walked over to the room where she was staying. The curtains were closed, but I could see that the light was still on inside. I knocked, but she didn't answer. I could hear movements on the other side though. I knew she was there. I turned to go back to my room, but something told me to stop. I had a strange feeling that something wasn't right. I looked around to make sure that no one else was looking. Then I leaned closer to the window and tried to look inside through the gap in the curtain. I saw the blonde woman lying on her bed. She was flailing around, covered in blood. Someone was standing over her, driving a knife into her stomach. I couldn't see the attacker clearly, but it looked like another woman. I was witnessing a murder. I had to stop it. I pounded the door, screaming. What are you doing? Then the door slowly creaked open and I couldn't believe who was standing on the other side. It was Gretchen, my wife. You should have stayed in your room, she said. I started to ask her what was going on, but she grabbed me before I could say anything. She would pulled me into the hotel room and I closed the door behind me. I almost threw up. The other woman was lying dead on the mattress. Blood was everywhere. What did you do? I asked. I killed her, 
she said. Just like I killed your other friend, Nikki. Why? Because I love you, she said. Very much. When she pulled back, I could finally see just how crazy she looked. We'd been married for a decade and I barely recognized her like this. I know what you're going to say, Gretchen said, and I forgive you. I know you'll never do anything like this again. We have to call the police, I told her. She laughed as if I'd said the dumbest thing in the world. You wouldn't do that. I'm your wife. Then she backed up sitting down on the bed. The dead body was right behind her. She patted the blood-soaked mattress, trying to get me to sit with her. Come here, she said. I'm in the mood. I had never felt so disgusted in my life. I couldn't even process what was happening. It was just too much. When I didn't say anything, Gretchen pulled the knife out of the woman's stomach and then pointed it at me. Hurry up, she said. I need to get some condoms from the other room, I told her. I'll be right back. Good thinking, she said. I ran out of there, but instead of going to my room, I went to the lobby and called the police. This all happened three months ago. Since then, Gretchen has been taken into custody, where she admitted to several other murders. I guess she hadn't been cheating on me at all. She'd been leaving the house to kill. I've known my wife since we were both 15. I had no idea she had this kind of darkness in her. I was never big into babysitting. From time to time, I could pick up a job to help a friend, or if one of my mom's friends couldn't find a sitter. As the youngest in my family, I never experienced caring for those younger than me, so babysitting always felt outside my scope of capabilities. I have a hard time knowing how to control kids. It's just, I never learned how to punish or handle kids appropriately. Not that I was doing or wanting anything inappropriate, but I always feared I'd do something wrong, and the parent would come home outraged that I put their kid in their room for 20 minutes. Like, what do you do when two thin boys pull their pants down and start peeing on each other in the middle of the living room, spraying all the expensive suede furniture? Better babysitters have an answer. I, on the other hand, stood in horror, shielding my eyes as I begged them to stop. They didn't, and I didn't take another babysitting job until my mom told me about this couple at their church that was desperate for a sitter. They offered me $150 for a night, which was astronomical back in the day. I didn't even think to ask why they were desperate. The kid's mom made it sound like an easy gig. One kid, 10 years old, get there at 5.30 p.m., and his bedtime was 8.30 p.m and she said they would get back around 11 to midnight. Three hours watching TV with a kid for $150? Absolutely, sign me up. They lived in a baby blue two-story home with white wood details on the windows. I knocked on the white door, and the boy's mom opened the door wearing a flattering maroon wrap dress. She was beautiful. My mom mentioned how stunning and young she looked for her age. Frankly, my mom didn't do this woman justice. She could have been a supermodel with her long auburn hair and mahogany eyes. Her name was Trish, and she insisted I call her by her first name. She invited me in. Trish had flawlessly decorated her home. It was the perfect balance of cozy with plush carpets and taste with sleek leather furniture. Thank you so much for doing this. You have no idea how hard it can be to find a sitter, she told me. She turned to yell up the stairs. Charles! Come meet your sitter, Lexi. A young boy descended the stairs. The energy of the room grew grim with each step he took. He got his hair and eye color from his mother. His hair was perfectly parted on the side like he was a little man going to work at a bank. Charles' choice of clothing contributed to his small man persona. He wore an argyle sweater vest over a white button-up with trousers. Charles did not strike me as a typical 10-year-old. Charles, this is Lexi. He looked up at me with a straight face. His mom continued. Say hi, Charles, please. Charles ignored his mother's pleas and nodded at me. Hi, Charles. I'm Lexi. Is it cool if I hang out with you tonight? I wanted it to seem like I knew what I was doing for his mom's sake, 
but it didn't seem Charles registered what I said. Please, Charles, Trish urged her son. He maintained his stoic aura. Trish's husband came around the corner holding a tiny tuxedo kitten. The kitten looked to be about five to six months old. He had white mittens and a white tip on his tail. When her husband eyed Charles standing in the foyer with us, he hesitated before coming closer. Trish nodded at him to encourage him to join us. He was equally as handsome as his wife. He wore glasses and dressed the same as his son. Oh yes, can you also feed Mr. Tingles? Trish asked. I love cats, so I was ecstatic to hang out with the kitten after the boy went to bed. Charles seemed indifferent towards the cat, rolling his eyes at his mother's evident excitement over Mr. Tingles. Before Trish left, she told me to call her if there were any issues, any at all. She would have her phone on her the entire time. After his parents left, Charles didn't speak. He stared at me the entire time. I tried to talk to him, but Charles wouldn't respond. He would just sit there like a ventriloquist dummy with a frown. I thought he might be excited about Mr. Tingles, but his frown grew more profound when I asked him about the cat. Complaining about a quiet kid feels weird, but something about Charles made my skin crawl. We sat down to eat our Kraft mac and cheese. Lexi? He broke the silence. Yes? If I put enough pressure, could I pierce your hand with my fork? Um, yeah, probably. Why? Charles shrugged and stabbed his mac and cheese to pick it up while keeping eye contact with me. What the hell? After dinner, I asked if he wanted to watch a movie. He didn't say anything, so I put one on because I was getting weirded out by the silence. We sat and watched a TV show his mom mentioned he liked. I tried to make time move faster until the kid needed to go to bed. His bedtime finally rolled around, and without saying anything, he got up from his spot on the couch and went up to the stairs to get ready for bed, taking the kitten with him. I told him I would clean up dinner and meet him up there to say goodnight. Of course, he wouldn't respond. As expected, he made no noise as he got ready for bed. He cleaned up the kitchen and went upstairs to check on him. He wasn't in the bedroom, so I walked around to his room, and he was lying on his stomach, reading a book in bed on his pillow. His elbows were propped up on the pillow, holding it down. Hey Charles, just checking to see how you're doing, or if you need anything. No response. Okay, cool. Before I turned to go back downstairs to leave the boy to his book, I realized I didn't see Mr. Tingles. Charles, where's Mr. Tingles? Does he sleep with you? I asked, hoping he would say no so I could cuddle with him after Charles went to bed. He didn't say anything and continued to read his book. As I turned around to walk away, I heard a weak and muffled meow. I turned to Charles and saw a small white-tipped tail whipping around from under the pillow, but I couldn't see Mr. Tingle's head. Charles, where's Mr. Tingle's? No response. Charles, please answer me. Where is Mr. Tingle's? He ignored me and continued to read. I could see the cat's tail peeking out from under the pillow, so I knew he had the cat fully under the pillow. Did he know that would suffocate the cat? I think he's under your pillow. You need to let him go, he can't breathe. No, he finally spoke. Charles. No, no, no! He started throwing a tantrum as I pleaded for him to release the cat. Mr. Tingles would suffocate, so with time running out and no other choice, I ran and picked Charles up to release the cat. Mr. Tingles bolted out of the room once he was released from Charles. I couldn't believe what had just taken place. Charles knew what he was doing and he wanted to kill Mr. Tingles. I wasn't sure how to react, so I made him go to bed then and there and locked him in his room. When his parents arrived home, I explained what happened and Trish burst into tears. Apparently, he killed their last cat, the cat Trish had for 13 years by putting it in the dryer. Trish recently got Mr. Tingles, hoping it was a one-time thing. Then, I understood why they had difficulty finding and keeping a sitter. I didn't babysit for them or anyone else again. I was in town for an impromptu business trip and needed somewhere to stay for the night. 
I hadn't been able to book anywhere in advance, so I ended up driving around until I managed to find a motel with a vacancy. There was only one car in the parking lot, and the street lamp was faulty, flickering out a grayish-white light across the pavement. But I was tired from a day packed with meetings and just wanted somewhere to sleep for the night. I left my luggage in my car and locked it before heading into the dingy, dimly lit reception. The place was less than clean, the air thick with dust and mildew, but I really didn't want to have to find somewhere else. I figured I'd just have to deal with some shabby accommodations for a night. A young, pale-looking man was seated at the desk. Behind him, a fly buzzed around a patch of dampness on the wall. Uh, excuse me? I said when he didn't immediately stir at my arrival. He lifted his gaze slowly. His eyes were sunken and dark, his cheeks gaunt. For a moment, I had debated just getting the hell out of there. But finally, he spoke. Need a room? I cleared my throat. Yeah, just for one night. He nodded, reaching beneath the counter for a key. Card or cash? Uh, cash? I didn't trust a place like this not to steal my card details when I wasn't looking. He grunted softly, punching something into the old-fashioned till in front of him. It was as cheap as I was expecting for a night at a place like this, and that made me doubt my decision to stay here even more. Maybe I should have kept looking for someplace nicer. Room 4 on the left, he said, his voice a low drawl. I took the key and thanked him before leaving. It wasn't until I was back outside that I noticed that it smelled odd in there. Something beyond the dust and grime. Something almost sweet. Grabbing my luggage from my car, I let myself into room 4 and flicked on the light. I looked around. The room was minimal. Sparsely furnished and a little dusty, but decent enough. As long as there weren't any bed bugs, I wasn't too picky. I made sure the door was locked before shrugging off my jacket and doing a cursory check of the room. The sheets were a little musty smelling, but seemed clean, and the trash bin was empty. That at least was a good sign. When I circled around the other side of the bed, I grimaced. There was a large stain on the carpet. Old, well sunken into the fabric, but unmistakable in its rusty brown-red hue. Blood. No doubt a place like this had some kind of sordid history. As long as I wasn't at risk. There was a closet, but I didn't bother opening it. I would be leaving first thing in the morning anyway. The bathroom was as grimy and stained as everything else, and there was some old hair clogging the shower drain, so I decided to forgo showering and wait until I got home. I was too exhausted to do anything else, and I collapsed straight into bed without bothering to change out of my clothes. It was in the middle of the night when I heard the closet doors slide open. I blinked open my eyes, darkness surrounding me. For a moment, I forgot where I was, then I remembered. The business conference. The shady motel. That's when it hit me. The reason why I woke up in the first place. I had heard the soft hiss of a door sliding open. I sat up in a panic, thinking there was someone in my room. My eyes adjusted to the darkness and I looked around. Nobody here. I was alone. Had I just imagined it? Breathing hard through my nose, I waited for my pulse to stop racing and got out of bed switching on the lamp. Nothing happened. I tried again, then gave up. Of course the lamp was broken. Relying on my own vision, I crept through the darkness towards the closet. I had nothing to defend myself with, so I just bunched my hand into a fist and got ready to punch the first thing that jumped out at me. With a bated breath, I threw open the closet doors. They were empty. I heaved a sigh of relief. I must have just imagined it after all. I was about to close them again when I heard something, a soft thump and a yell from the other side of the wall. I froze. Holding my breath again, I listened. On the other side of the wall, I heard this shuffle of movement and then silence. If the walls were this thin, then it likely wasn't my closet doors I had heard open, but the ones next door. I hadn't seen any other cars in the parking lot, so who else was staying here? Curious, I stepped into the closet to listen closer. That's when I realized there was a small hole in the wall, moonlight peeking through it. The hole was small enough to go unnoticed, but large enough to peer through if I squinted. Positioning my eye against the hole, I looked through to the other side. 
At first, I saw nothing but darkness, then a shadow moving across the room, and something lying on the ground. A figure, bathed in a pale moonlight, a red stain slowly spreading around their lifeless body. Horror gripped my chest, but I couldn't look away from the gruesome visage. It was only when another eye appeared on the other side of the hole that I managed to yank away from the wall, staggering back and almost tripping over the edge of the bed. What had I gotten myself into? Fumbling to grab my phone, I immediately dialed the police, but my phone wouldn't connect to the call. Something was jamming the signal. My heart froze in my chest when I heard footsteps walking outside. I turned slowly to face the door, the phone almost slipping from my fingers. Not a second later, the handle began to turn. My heart pounded in my chest as the doorknob slowly turned, and I felt a surge of panic. I had no idea who or what was on the other side of that door, but the events of the night had left me on edge. With the phone signal jammed and no way to call for help, I had to rely on my own wits and instincts to survive this eerie motel encounter. As the door creaked open, I grabbed the closest object I could find, a heavy lamp from the nightstand, and held it tightly in my trembling hands. The dim, flickering light from the faulty street lamp outside cast eerie shadows in the room, making it even harder to discern who was entering. A figure emerged from the darkness, shrouded in a long, tattered coat. Their face was obscured, and they moved silently, almost ghost-like. My heart raced as I tightened my grip on the lamp, ready to defend myself if necessary. The intruder took a few steps into the room, their intentions unclear. Were they the one responsible for the gruesome scene next door? Or were they just another weary traveler who had chosen this rundown motel for the night? I couldn't be sure. Before I could react, the figure turned towards me, and I braced myself for whatever might happen next. But instead of aggression, I saw a glimmer of fear and desperation in their eyes. They looked as terrified as I felt. Who are you? I managed to stammer, my voice barely above a whisper. The stranger hesitated for a moment, then finally spoke in a hushed tone. You need to get out of here, now. I didn't need any more convincing. Without a second thought, I bolted for the door, leaving my belongings behind. The stranger followed closely behind, and together we hurried down the dimly lit hallway, past the reception desk where the pale-faced motel clerk was nowhere to be seen. We reached the exit, and as I pushed open the door, a wave of relief washed over me. We were outside, away from the unsettling motel. I turned to the stranger, my heart still racing, and asked, What's going on? What did you see? The stranger's voice quivered as they replied. I saw something terrible, something I, I can't explain. This place is cursed, and those who stay here don't leave. We, we have to go now. We didn't waste any more time. We jumped into my car and sped away from that eerie motel, leaving it behind in the darkness. As we drove, the stranger finally introduced himself as the fellow traveler who had made the mistake of staying in that motel a few nights earlier. He had seen things that defied explanation. We both knew we had narrowly escaped something sinister, something that lurked within the motel's walls. It was a night I would never forget, a night that left me with more questions than answers and a deep sense of unease whenever I thought about that blood-stained carpet and the horrors that had unfolded in the rooms next door. I have a friend I once met on TikTok. He had the same vibes as mine, and I enjoyed watching his videos as much as I enjoyed creating mine. We soon got talking and formed a bond. It came as a pleasant surprise when I found out that we lived in the same neighborhood. It happened that there was a fire outbreak in my neighborhood, and I rushed out to capture the content for my followers. He must have gone out to make the same live video, because while we were recording, we bumped into each other, and our focus shifted from the live video to each other. I was elated to see him, and it brought great joy to my heart that he was elated to see me, too. We completed the video together and hung out that night. Getting to know each other wasn't a hassle. We spent hours outside talking about random things, our likes and dislikes, and most importantly, 
how we ended up creating content on TikTok. When we each returned to our houses, an unbreakable bond was formed. Soon we started creating content together, and it became a friendship I didn't want to lose. We didn't just create content, we committed to doing live videos together too. Our fan base increased, and people knew us as always being together. The only thing that divided us was the school we attended. We weren't in the same high school. But it didn't matter, we had the rest of the day and the weekend to ourselves. However, one day, during one of our usual live sessions, a viewer started a fight with us. He didn't agree with one or two of the things we said, and we got into a heated argument. If he said a word, we attacked with two, so on and so forth. We eventually ended the live session when the viewer threatened to see the end of both of us. It didn't make sense that what we created to bring fun to the people was causing a lot of trouble to one douchebag. We didn't end the video because we got scared, we just thought it was best to avoid the tantrums of such a person and risk losing the rest of our fans. Although we were hurt by the occurrences of the day, we chose to ignore the fight and move on like it never happened. Life continued for us as usual. Well, that was until life decided to take a new turn. One afternoon after school, I was walking back to my home. I thought at first that I was hallucinating, but it was impossible to conclude that the human in a black hoodie wasn't looking for me. I was scared and hoped that it didn't mean anything. I sincerely hoped that I was imagining it. I walked cautiously out of that area and made sure that I didn't leave the confines of my mates. But it wasn't long before everyone dispersed. Some into cars, others onto different routes. Soon I was left alone. I could still sense that someone was watching me. And when I went down a few blocks, I caught sight of the hoodie again. The man was still following me, or so it seemed. That counted as the only plausible explanation for seeing him again. With a few tricks I learned from movies, I tried to lose the person. After a few more blocks, the strange sensation was gone, and I believed that I was freed from the pair of eyes that were watching my every move. Later in the evening, my TikTok friend came over as usual. I had forgotten all about the black hoodie guy that followed me, until he mentioned it too. We encountered the same thing after school, but managed to shake the stranger off. It became easy for us to conclude that we were being watched, but since we didn't have a way to prove it, we chose to keep silent about the occurrence and watch for evidence or be careful next time. My friend suggested that we monitor things carefully from now on. We were glad that the hooded man didn't follow us home, at least. It was a Saturday, and I was in my room listening to music and also drafting out the new idea I had for some new content on TikTok. Hunger gripped me in full force while I was at it, and I decided to grab some snacks from the kitchen. On my way to the kitchen, just at the entrance, I came across a footprint. The one sole footprint remained in its position, not preceded by any, not succeeded by any. A strange feeling captured me. But seeing as I had no way to solve the problem or understand the mystery, I decided to leave it as it is. I walked to the fridge, took some drinks, and turned to leave when I heard the creaking of my wooden veranda. I peeked through the window, but I saw no one or human form. However, I still heard sounds that confirmed the presence of someone on the veranda. I picked up the nearest knife to me and moved stealthily towards the direction of the sound. The cat jumped out of fright, and I jumped too, but I reclaimed my composure immediately. I was glad that the sound wasn't that of a human. I breathed a sigh of relief, but jumped again when I turned, and my friend was behind me. I asked how he got in, and he claimed he walked in from the back door because he found it open. I nodded in response, and the two of us went into my room. In a matter of time, night fell. We were still in my room when intuition caused me to look outside my window. I could taste the fear I felt in my mouth. The hooded guy stood right outside my window with an ax in his hand. Quickly, I told my friend to get us live on TikTok to the oblivion of the hooded guy. He set the camera in place, but while he did that, the man found his way into the house. Luckily, I had the knife I took in the kitchen earlier. When he attacked, I attacked too. I made sure to see that my friend was recording. 
He set the camera in place as we tried to fight for our lives. In the process, we mentioned our street and neighborhood, hoping that one of the viewers would recognize that we weren't putting on a show, but were in real danger. As I fought the man and dodged the axe in his hand, the fear of death encapsulated me. I didn't know how long we would last in that room. But then, when I heard the sound of sirens some moment later, joy swelled within me. The man tried to escape, but it wasn't possible. The police officers came and made the arrest. My friend and I were glad to be free from the stalker and potential murderer. We also thanked our audience and followers for helping us out in the time of danger. After that encounter, my friend and I made sure that we never got into a fight on TikTok ever again.